Good afternoon. Welcome to Midday Live. We're broadcasting from our studios here at Adesanwe in Accra. My name is Solis Rose Quarte. For the next 60 minutes, we'll be giving you updates from the world of politics, sports, entertainment, as well as some business news. Coming up. Now, one person dead and six others hospitalized in Pando after consuming the highly poisonous pufferfish. We will be live from Pando. Also coming up, Parliament sits to consider cash for seats after majority wrote to Speaker to recall the House. Now coming up also, questions emerge over how the autopsy report of murdered Ibuakwa MP JB Dankwa Edu has gone missing in the custody of a pathologist. And coming up in business, the second deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana resigns from his post after weeks of speculation. Right, we have more also from the international front. But let's start over to what is currently happening in Parliament. And let's start with uh, the fact that the MPs have returned to Parliament for an emergency sitting today, Friday, January 5. The sitting was forced by the minority National Democratic Congress, NDC, legislators to demand an investigation into allegations that the Trades Ministry sold seats to expatriates who wanted access to President Akufuado at the Expert Trades Awards held last month. The presidency cleared the Trades Minister Alan Tremanting and his deputy of any wrongdoing following the public outcry over the matter in December. Now still on Parliament, on January 6 in 2014, four years ago, the Parliament dismissed the motion by the Deputy Minority Leader Dominic Nitiwo and some members of the minority seeking to investigate the sale of Merchant Bank to Forty's Equity Fund. In his ruling, the Speaker of Parliament, Edward Do Ajao, noted the motion filed was prejudicial and out of order since some aspects of the matter was already before court. Parliament reconvened on Monday, January 6, 2013, for an emergency sitting over the motion filed by Deputy Minority Leader Dominic Nettewool and other members of Parliament of the minority seeking to investigate the sale of Merchant Bank to Forties Equity Fund. In his opening statement, Majority Leader and Chairman of the Business Committee of the House, Dr. Benjamin Kumbu, said the Business Committee was unable to reach a consensus on the requirement and non-requirement of notice and asked the Speaker of Parliament for guidance. After, the Speaker of Parliament, Edward Duajaho, ruled for Deputy Minority Leader Dominic Nettewool to take his motion. His motion was arrested by Majority Leader Dr. Benjamin Kumbu, citing the Standing Order 93 Clause 1. Honorable Ntiwul, kindly move your motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> for... Is there a point of order against that... the Chair? The matter on the Fortis Bank acquisition sale or otherwise disposal of shares is a matter that is pending before a competent court or competent court of jurisdiction of this case. Mr. Speaker, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that this matter was before a high court in which a ruling has been done in relation to one issue and two rulings in that ruling are supposed to be made by 27th of January. Mr. Speaker, is also a matter of record. That there is an appeal and a settlement of record on the initial ruling at the High Court before the Court of Appeal. It is my candid opinion that given the pendency of this matter, 
and the possibility that parties' interests will be compromised, Mr. Speaker, in relation to this matter. I would ask that let's be guided and to find out whether it is not possible to defer this inquiry till after the determination of the court case. Others provide that reference shall not be made to any matter on which the social decision is pending in such a way as may, in the opinion of Mr. Speaker, prejudice the interest of parties to the motion, to the action. The Speaker, you have looked at the test of the motion. You did not find it prejudicial. Mr. Speaker, as, Honorable as, as Minority Leader, now, if I found it prejudicial and I didn't comply with Article 1, 1, 2, 3, what happens? Mr. Speaker, because Mr. that was I'm the dilemma I found, that was the dilemma I found myself. Mr. I Mr. found, I, I, I saw, assuming, I saw it prejudicial, but I have to recall the House and Article 1, 1, 2, 3. What do I have to do? Mr. Speaker, it is my contention that as the House is constituted now, there's nothing before us. Mr. Speaker, there's nothing before us if the motion is not moved and seconded. Sutton was suspended for an hour for leadership of the House to reach a consensus on whether the motion should be filed or not. After an hour, the Speaker of Parliament gave his ruling. It is therefore my ruling that a discussion of this motion will prejudice the parties to the various cases tentatively before the court. The point of order is hereby sustained. Accordingly, the motion calling on this House to investigate the offer by an acquisition by Fortis Equity Fund Limited and other related matters is ruled out of order. All right, so that was proceedings in Parliament about four years ago regarding the 40s and Merchant Bank deal. Now, let's come back to present day, and we're actually expecting the emergency sitting to start at 12 noon. We will be crossing over to Parliament at some point um, to our correspondent, Catherine Frimpong. But before that, we have in studio George Lowe. Now, he is a former member of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee of Parliament. Good afternoon, sir, and thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. All right. Me, yeah. Many thanks for having us. Now, um, can we? Can you take us briefly through what exactly the process to to expect for the proceedings this afternoon? Well, um, as you are aware, um, some members of parliament, uh, as the rules require, fifteen percent of members of parliament, once they petition the speaker for a recall, the speaker is mandated to do so, and and so the speaker have done so. He's instructed the parliament to convene today. Now, when, he, when they do reconvene, yeah. of course, there'll be the normal business uh, statement, but then leadership would have met and decided the order of business. What is also important to note is that by now, attached to the issue of recall would have been a motion that was, is going to be moved. Okay. So when the House convenes, they will go through the normal order of business under chapter, uh, under article, uh, uh, order 53, I believe where you have various um, processes, the prayer and all that. Mm. Once that is done, then the majority leader will have to tell us why we are in, and the process kickstarts. Start. So, okay. so basically, that is, that is what it will be. Right. Then Mr. Speaker would now, uh, under, somebody will come under Order 53 and, and, and say that there's an urgent motion, and therefore, as to whether the motion will be moved, will not be moved, and all that will yeah. play out from there. So, so it depends on what Mr. Speaker, what Mr. Speaker wants to do. Okay. All right. Now, um, during the 40s deal, right, during the 40s deal, now we saw the posturing of the then majority that you were part of and also the, the posturing of the man minority. Now, the, the minority, the majority then, of course, ruled a no, the, the minority was pushing for the investigation. It seems the tables have turned right now. Are we to expect a similar, um, you know, motion? Ob obvious, obviously, I mean, it would be 
nothing different. A minority is a minority, mm. a majority is a majority. Okay. The agenda today is to push for Mr. Speaker to order a, for a bipartisan uh, 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 investigation into the matter. So the minority who basically are the proponents of that motion mm. will be all for it. You would expect Definitely. you would expect that the mm. majority would be against it. As you can, even if you read the mood in the public domain, they've already started saying that it's a frivolous motion and all that. So, so business as usual. Mm. Once you find yourself on the other side of the aisle, mm. your posturing will take a certain disposition. I mean, there will be a certain disposition, and, 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 and that is it. Right. Okay. No, I'll, I'll get back to yeah, you. But yeah. we've also been joined in the studio by Dr. Rashid Rahman. He's executive director of ASEPA. Thank you very much for joining us. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so we are talking about the what is supposed to happen this afternoon, the um, emergency sitting in Parliament regarding the request by the minority for the House to investigate or the Speaker to investigate the um, alleged um, overcharging or charging of the expatriate mm -hmm. businessmen to sit closer to the president during the award ceremony. Um, I was asking um, the honorable here whether or not anything might be different, considering the fact that, of course, and then it was a minority in 2014 with the Fortis deal, there was a minority that was pushing for the investigation, but it was thrown out. Mm. Do you think the minority now has a strong enough case for this to be sustained and for the investigation to go on? Um, thank you very much. I think ordinarily, um, if we were not in the kind of situation in which we are, uh, very deep partisan division mm. that we see always, particularly on issues that are sensitive, I mean politically sensitive in, uh, in this country. As Honorable said, um, once a minority takes a position I think it's almost certain that you are going to see the, minor, the majority taking a directly opposite position. I mean, otherwise, this is um, an issue of national interest. Mm. Um, this is an issue that all our MPs must take interest in, in the, in the name of uh, their role in providing oversight. Mm. But given the recent history, and then, the, if you like, some of the commentary that we've had in the in in the media. Just uh, when I was on my way here, I mean, I I mean, read the comments attributed to the um, honourable from Kwandai, Matthew Yinda, yeah, majority, yeah. uh, majority whip. Um, I mean, if you read these kinds of comments, mm. then uh, you would be in a position to predict what is going to happen very shortly. Okay. Now, um, he, he's made a point which I would like to throw to you. Now, he's pointed out the fact that there seems to be a clear, you know, partisan divide. Do you agree with that? Oh, 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 obviously. Okay. I mean, you can't run away. You, you, unless you not live in Ghana, you can't, okay. you can't run away from the fact that there's always a partisan div divide. Which means regardless, the majority yeah, but, is always going to be with see, the majority. Not necessarily, but he makes a very fantastic point also. Okay. What is the issue before Parliament today? Um, if we want to be Ghanaian okay. in character, I think that we should all want to get to the root of this matter right. by calling for a bipartisan investigation which will lead, lay the matter to rest. Okay. Right. Now, it's interesting part is that, yes, in 2014, Right Honorable uh, Doha Jaho then threw out the motion because of the point of order, uh, you know, raised by the then majority leader, ben Kumbu, Dr. Ben Kumbu. Could you give me one second? Yeah. I have been informed that uh, these are live um, pictures from the floor of parliament. Um, we are yet to see the Speaker of Parliament and the leaders in there. But we'll still be keeping you updated. As I mentioned earlier, Catherine Frimpoma is on the ground and she'll be bringing us updates as to exactly what will happen on the mm. floor this afternoon. Again. So, so question you ask yourself is, yes. Today, will the majority leader be able to raise the same point of order? Okay. The question is no. All right. Because there's no pending matter in court. Okay. Yeah. You know. True. So which direction is Mr. P uh, Speaker coming from? We are all waiting to see. Mm. You cannot predict him at this stage. Mm. But it's our wish that he would come, he will allow the motion to be moved, he will allow the debate to take place, and give his ruling. Mm. And I would expect a ruling which says that, well, look, like uh, Doc said, this is a matter of national concern. Uh, it, it, it goes to the root of our 
sovereignty, our citizenship, and many other things. Mm -hmm. And therefore, let's put up a bipartisan uh, um, uh, committee. Let them go into the matter. The minority is saying that they have documents. So let them tend out those documents. And, and let's see how uh, Parliament plays its role as an oversight uh, body. Now, D Dr. Dramani, now what, in your opinion, would be the implications regarding whichever way the ruling goes today? Um, On Parliament, that is. Yes, I think uh, if, if we see a repeat of what happened um, in the sixth parliament, mm. then I think it's only going to confirm, it's only going to confirm that, you know, you have only the minority at all times interested in pushing for oversight and accountability. And the majority um, always interested in defending uh, the government of the day. Um, if the ruling if Mr. Speaker decides to set up a bipartisan committee to look at this, um, then I think um, it it adds some value to our I mean um, democratic dispensation. It opens maybe another frontier mm. that look um, even the government of the even the, the, the I mean the majority is interested in investigating. Um, perceived maybe wrong acts of his own uh, his own government. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think that this 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 will be the the, the implication. Already, this seventh parliament, I think, didn't start quite well in mm. terms of the numerous scandals and uh, all the mm. issues that have bedeviled this parliament. And we don't want a situation where Ghanaians would um, begin to to think that you know um, the perception that is already out there is that you know um, because of the kind of arrangements that we have the constitutional arrangements and so on uh, oversight is always the the i mean a preserve of of the of the minority okay now briefly before we wrap up both of you have pointed out the one you know, particular issue. The fact that there needs to be a bipartisan attitude towards this. Is it ever possible? Will it ever be possible for this to happen? Well, um, yes, it should be possible. It has happened in, 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 in Parliament's own case over the corruption. There was a bipartisan committee that was supposed to look into it. Mm -hmm. And so if they can do it for themselves, I mean, when it comes to national issues, Parliament should be able to to have a bipartisan uh, 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 committee that will look at these things dispassionately and come up with, you know, some some report that that will would 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 stand the test of time, okay. uh, as as it were. All right. Yeah, Briefly I think. Before we go. Yes, I mean, for me, I, I I would I would like to see that I would like to see that happen. Uh, regrettably, um, not too long ago in 2016, I mean, during the Ford um, yes, uh, saga and so on. I mean, you, you, you see a repeat of, of what we saw in 2016. The minority then, now the majority, um, said that this was necessary. The majority then, now the minority, said this is a waste of time. And the tables have That's turned, right. and then we are hearing almost like a kind of um, um, complete rehearsal of, 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 uh, of 2016. We need to depart from that. Right. Yeah. Indeed. Thank you very much, Dr. Rashid Ramani. He is the executive director of the African Center for Parliamentary Affairs. And also, I've been here with Honorable George Lowe. He is a former member of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee of Parliament. And basically, we've been talking about the emergency sitting that was called by the minority in Parliament to ask the Speaker to investigate the issue regarding the charges or alleged charges that were, you know, for the businessmen or the expert businessmen during the awards ceremony where they were charged between 25,000 US dollars and 100,000 US dollars just for a seat 
near the president. Now, still on Parliament, the Speaker of Parliament, Right Honorable Professor Michael Quay, has advised Burundi to strengthen its democracy to encourage free speech and religious coexistence. He said reviewing the country's constitution will form a basis for this democratic transformation. The Speaker was receiving the Senate Speaker of the Republic of Burundi, Right Honorable Reverend Indikurio. The Senate Speaker of the Republic of Burundi, who is also the President of the Burundi Football Association, paid a courtesy call on the Speaker as part of his visit to Ghana to participate in the CAF Awards ceremony. He bemoaned the bad press Burundi has received in the last five years, saying most of the things were misrepresented by the international media. He said the political and economic climate has been stabilized since the Arusha declaration in Tanzania last year as the nation prepares for a peaceful election in 2020. The Right Honourable Speaker, Professor Michael Quay, assured his counterpart Ghana was ready to assist in any way possible in this democratic reformation. The difficulties that came were not necessarily that much of religious uh, astuteness. Um, this is the kind of thing that I think we on this continent must all sign for. Muslims, Christians living together according to the religion that they prefer without that becoming a source of confusion. The minority leader, Haruna Idrisu, said there were several things Ghana could learn from Burundi's parliament, like the 30% women representation. He, however, called for freedom of expression as the country tries to rebuild its image. I believe in particular one of the things that they need to look at is an unacceptable crackdown of the media in Burundi. As we speak, a number of FM stations are closed down. An essential ingredient of any democracy is an independent, pluralistic media. So we encourage them to allow for the growth of the media as true servants of democracy in that country. You're still watching Midday Live and you are coming to you live from our studios here at Adesanwe in Accra. Let's move away from issues of parliament and do some other stories. And one person has been confirmed dead and six others hospitalized in Pando in the Volta region after consuming the highly poisonous puffer fish. Now, this is not the first time the consumption of the poisonous fish has claimed a life in the municipality. Four people died last year after consuming the same fish. Now, the municipal chief executive for Pando, Elvis Jampo, says the sick have been admitted to the hospital for medical monitoring. Right, so we're sticking to this particular story and we're, we're, we've been joined on the phone lines by the Municipal Chief Executive for Pando, Elvis Jampo. Good afternoon, sir. Many thanks for joining us. Good afternoon. Right. Now, you have already said that uh, there are some of them in, in, in the hospital. What is their state right now? Oh, this, this time they have been treated and discharged. But then could you please kindly speak up for us? Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, on the 23rd of uh, December, I was in the house when uh, uh, a task force I set up some time ago came to report to me that there was an incident of uh, 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 people eating the same fish and uh, as a result they are being hospitalized. So we went there to check up. And we, we we send the task force to go again to the fishing communities and our market to verify whether they have flouted our order not to sell those fish in the municipality. We went round and created awareness that such uh, that fish should. Should not be sold. 
In fact, we have placed a ban on the fish. You have placed a ban on the fish? We, we've placed on the sales of the on fish. On the sale of the fish, so, okay. Yeah, so every market day, people go around, the task force go, go around to, to, to see that that fish is not so. Yeah. Now, how, how long has this been ongoing regarding the task force going around? Well, how long has this been? Well, since the first incident, about some two months ago, mm. yeah. There well, was actually... So it's about it's about five months ago. Yes, it was in August 2017. Yes, yes. About four people you know, died in Alavano. Yes, Alavano, yes. Okay. But this time, this time around, it's not from Alavano. Yes. It's from uh, the Biakwe district. Yeah. Now, regarding this particular issue, you're saying that a tax force was in place, and there was also an issue regarding the fact that the FDA and the Ministry of Fisheries were supposed to collaborate and then conduct some education of these, you know, market yeah. women and as well as the fishermen. What? How come, regardless of all these things, or in spite of what you're saying, the fact that the task force has been in place all this while, how come we're here again today? Well. Um even uh, the victims, when we, when we interviewed them, they claimed they had been eating this fish, nothing happened, and uh, uh, they didn't see that it was uh, poisonous or dangerous to be eating, you know. So, well, uh, many people still do not believe that this fish is dangerous to their health. Yeah. So Probably is how it is prepared and so on. So people still question that uh, uh, the, 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 this fish it's delicious, and uh, uh, they, they can't avoid taking it. Now, yes, of course, people will take whatever they feel that tastes yes. nice to them. But at the end of the day, it is causing an issue. Yes. We have just one death now. One death too many, actually. What is the way forward? Well, uh, we still co continue our education and awareness, you know, all along the lake. And when we've extended it to our sister... Um, uh, the sister and uh, uh, the neighboring this too. Yeah. Now, but, ha you were talking uh, about the fact that uh, a ban has been placed on we, the fishing we have of puffer fish. A ban on it yes. in ha our uh, district. Mm -hmm. yeah. now, ha ha has there been any arrests or mm. anything like well, that? We've, we have not caused any arrests here, though. Mm. So what is the penalty? I mean, there's a ban. So what is the penalty? The ban. Oh, that will confiscate the goods. You know, we confiscate them and uh, ask you to come and take it at the police station. Right? So we see the way forward. Yeah. All right. Many we thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us this afternoon. We we're speaking with the Municipal Chief Executive for Pando, Elvis Jampo, regarding the fact that one person has died in Pando from puffer fish poisoning and six others are also in the hospital. Um, let's go for a quick break. We'll be right back with more on Midday Life. Don't go away. Welcome back to Midday Live from Ade Sanwe. And let's do some other stories. And the autopsy report on the former member of parliament for MP, that's the MP for Ibuakwa North, Mr. J.B. Dankwa Edu, who was murdered on February 9, 2016, is missing. Now, Dr. Lawrence Edu said the pathologist who conducted the autopsy on the former legislator revealed this at the Accra Central District Court on Thursday. According to him, his house was burgled in September 2017 and the computer which contained the autopsy report and thousands of other autopsy reports was stolen by the thieves. Dr. Eduse was before the court presided over by Ms. Arit Insemo after he had been subpoenaed in November 2017 to explain why he had not furnished the police with a full autopsy report 21 months after Mr. Dankwedu was murdered. The subpoena followed concerns raised by police prosecutors that the pathologist had failed to release the report and all attempts to obtain it had proved futile. The delay in the release of the reports, the police said, had hampered their efforts to build a solid case against Daniel Asiedu, a.k.a. Sexy Don Don, and Vincent Bosso, a.k.a. Junior Agogo, the two men linked to the murder of the former member of parliament.
All right, now let's interrogate this issue further. We're, we're going to speak to a lawyer, George Bernard Shaw, um, to get more details of what to do in a situation like this. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for joining us. Good afternoon. Right. And happy New Year to you all there. Many happy returns. Now, let's head straight into this. What do you make of this story of the aut autopsy report you know, getting missing? In one breath, the pathologist <coughs> is saying that um, the state owes him. Then in another, he, he decides to say it was stolen from his, uh, his home. Um, well, um, I am not privy to whatever happened to him. But uh, for your purposes, I think what I can say is that it's quite unfortunate that um, such an important report um, will go missing because basically in cases such as those um, without going into the merits of the case because it's sub DGC that is, is before the court mm. um, they will basically because um, a pathologist uh, report helps a lot uh, in terms of prosecution in terms of identifying <coughs> the cause of death, and mm. then the probable causes of death. So without that, it, it, it is going to be a very uh, difficult uh, task for the prosecution um, speaking generally. Okay, so is it, is it possible to state specifically the kind of difficulty that could arise if this report is not provided? Well, uh, it's an issue of um, who caused it, because if you are accusing some people that they did it, then you need to link them. Mm. So obviously, uh, um, weapons uh, that are in, in their possession or are like are linked to the uh, disease in terms of blood and things like that. So generally, um, a pathologist will be able to say that um, this um, blood came from this uh, instrument, and this instrument was used by this person. So therefore, um, there's a high probability that he might have caused it but um so i don't know what <laughs> was in the report but uh, generally um a pathologist report helps the police in terms of identifying who actually caused the crime now, now sir how is this likely to affect the process the progress rather of this particular case well i suppose they will carry on as it is but because uh the police have to uh, provide what evidence they have for the trial to go on. So if, uh, because there are uh, many instances where, even though this is such a high profile case, and also it's a very serious, um, what do you call it, a crime. Mm. But there have been uh, instances where uh, exhibits have been lost, and mm. it, it cannot be retrieved, and it cannot be put before the court. The court goes on and deals with whatever evidence they have. Okay. Because there may be other bits of evidence from other sources mm. that will all come together to build the case. So, um, a short of abandoning the the search mm. for the report, um, the trial has to go on. So they will just put before the court what they have. Now, briefly, on 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 the side of the law, can the pathologist be held accountable in any way? I I am not. Uh, uh, I wouldn't be in a position to say that in, yeah. in terms of, because the, the pathologist, just like uh, any other professional, uh, uh, can be uh, held liable if yeah. they are found to be professionally uh, ne negligent. Okay. And uh, so um, <clears throat> I don't know the instances of this case. I don't know what transpired. Right. Uh, so I wouldn't, but yeah, there's a general system. If there is a case for any professional to be held uh, responsible for some negligence in the course of their duty. Thank okay. you. General law for that. All right. Many thanks. Thank you so very much for joining us this afternoon. We've been speaking with Bernard Shaw. He is a lawyer and we're basically touching on the fact that it has been revealed by the pathologist that uh, the pathology report or the autopsy report of the late MJB um, Dankwa Edu MP for Ibuakwa North is missing. Let's move away from that and do some other stories. And the 11 special courts set up to deal with people who refuse to pay the mandatory TV license fees failed to sit on Thursday, January 4, 2018 as scheduled. This was because no docket on any defaulters was pro pro presented rather to the court. 
Mixed reactions greeted the setting up of the special TV license court to deal with people who refused to pay the mandatory TV license, with some arguing that the state broadcaster does not deserve the money. One of the courts is the Accra Circuit Court presided over by Harriet Aquilique. Though it is scheduled to handle cases of TV license fees every Thursday, it could not begin sitting on January 4. This was attributed to the absence of docket on defaulters. Prosecution will not begin anytime soon as the Legal and Compliance Department of the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation is yet to identify defaulters or charge any person. The Chief Justice Sophia Kufu established the court after a request by the state broadcaster Ghana Broadcasting Corporation GBC in a bid to boost revenue. Meanwhile, pressure group Occupy Ghana has described the law on TV license as obsolete and should therefore be repealed. The group also disagrees with the setting up of a special court to prosecute defaulters. Now, the president, Akufuado, has met with leaders of the various political parties and in the country to seek their views on some governance enhancing measures his administration intends to take. The three-hour discussion centered on the elections of metropolitan, municipal and district chief executives and the creation of new regions. Well, up next is some updates from the world of business. The business segment is brought to you by... And now for some business news. And the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, COPEC, has said uh, the National Petroleum Authority's assurance of price stability is commendable. However not the best. It also said it's time for the MPA to look at its pricing structure and reduce some of the taxes to ensure reduction in prices. The National Petroleum Authority at the end of 2016 announced prices of petrol and liquefied petroleum gas will remain fairly stable at the pumps from January 1, 2018. According to the NPA, the decision is in line with a drop in crude and petroleum prices on the world market, as well as stability in the exchange rate. The authority added it had activated the price stabilization and recovery levy to stem potential upward adjustment in the price of diesel. But the executive director of the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, Duncan Amwa, says motorists are seeking price reduction and not price stabilization. We would want the government to at least uh, make further efforts to reduce prices at the pumps. Uh, we believe strongly that anything other than an attempt to reduce prices would see Ghanaians paying much more uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, already at 20.20, it's high. International trends are also not pointing downwards. Uh, they are pointing at prices going up further on the international market. He called on government and the NPA to look at its pricing structure and let go of some taxes. We would want to see the Special Petroleum Tax SPT, uh, which stands at 15% of uh, X depot price, uh, taking off completely. Uh, once that is done, SPT today stands at almost 52 pesos per litre. And so if you buy 4.5 litres, you're almost doing 2 CD 50 pesos. What that means is that if that alone uh, was even tackled, fuel prices could come down uh, to about 17.50. Now away from that, some traders conducting business on pavements and other open spaces at the Central Business District are pleading with city authorities to give them some more time to relocate. The Accra Metropolitan Assembly is set to embark on a decongestion exercise on Monday, January 8, 2018, to permanently evict traders. Here at the Central Business District, Almost every item under the sun is sold on pavement and even on major roads. The situation often leads to congestion as traders, consumers and vehicles compete for space. 
This is not the first time such a decongestion exercise is going to be carried out in Accra. However, these hawkers and traders always find their way back to conducting bricks business on pavements and other open spaces. The Accra Metropolitan Assembly has warned a task force made up of the police and some personnel from the assembly will on Monday, January 9, permanently evict all traders encroaching on pavements, open spaces and other ceremonial routes in the city. Chief Executive Officer of the Accra Metropolitan Assembly has already warned the exercise will be sustained. This particular exercise uh, will be done in collaboration with major stakeholders, including the Ghana Railway Authority, the Ghana Police, the, the military, mm -hmm. our own Metro Guards, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. who are going to be the men on the ground, mm -hmm. and then with major stakeholders, mm -hmm. including the media. But the affected traders are begging city authorities to give them some more time to relocate. We beg them to excite patients for help because we are paying our, our children's school fees. Now, after months of speculation, the latest news has it that the second deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana, Dr. Johnson Isiama, has resigned from his post. Sources at the central bank say Dr. Isiama sent his resignation letter to the presidency last Friday, which read, I wish to submit my disengagement letter from the post of second deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana with effect from January 1, 2018. I have enjoyed working with the new team for the past one year and remain optimistic about the prospects of the economy. The resignation letter read in part. Now, he has confirmed his resignation to three news. The resignation definitely comes after weeks of media speculation of his exit. Dr. Isiama's tenure at the bank would have officially ended in April 2020. You're still watching Midday Live on TV3. We'll be right back after this. Stay with us. Right, so you're back from that break. There's still Midday Live here on TV3. My name is Yao Ofosulab. Now, on to our very first story. Because Egypt International Mohamed Salah was named 2017 CAF African Player of the Year at the African Football Award Ceremony in Accra. Salah took home the award for the first time as he beat off competition from teammates Sadio Mane and Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. The 25-year-old says winning the award should inspire kids across the continent. The winner is Mohamed Salah. Right, so that was Mohamed Salah, but still on the CAF Awards. Ghana's Ibrahim Sande, who was named Legend of the Year, says the award came as a shock to him. Sande won the best player of the tournament in, of the continent in 1971 after his many exploits for club and country and says it is always refreshing when CAF decides to honor some of the continent's greats of the beautiful game. I was surprised because I was not uh, expecting it. And uh, I was so happy that uh, after all these young, long years, CAF, especially the president of CAF, 
and his uh, committee have been able to remember that I'm one of the pioneers of African football. And so they recognized me and gave me this award. So I thank Allah for that and uh, I wish them the best of uh, luck in their uh, uh, endeavors. Right now in entertainment today, the Ghana Tourism Authority will this year launch a homestay project where residents at Kwehu would be allowed to officially use their houses for commercial accommodation purposes during the paragliding festival. At the launch of the 13th edition of the annual event, Chief Executive Officer of the Authority, Kwesi Ajiman, said this is part of measures to address accommodation problems during the annual event. Accommodation for patrons of the annual paragliding festival has always been a challenge. Some patrons booked for accommodation at hotels and guest houses as early as November the previous year, ahead of the event which is usually slated for late March and early April. Property owners take the opportunity to illegally convert their residential apartment into guest houses since there is always market for it. The Ghana Tourism Authority says they are collaborating with the Kohu Tourist Initiative to make the struggle for accommodation a thing of the past. There's a homestay project that uh, we're working with with the Kohu Tourist Initiative, where people who have homes and houses would also open up to visitors who are coming in. Obviously, we are also mindful of the fact that um, you can't stop people from saying, oh, my home is here, come and stay there. But to the extent that it's going to be used for commercial purposes, we want them to do the proper thing, register, we respect the place and make sure that there is decent enough. Again, the authority is collaborating with NADMO to provide tent accommodation for revelers. He explained the authority is also collaborating with the Hoteliers Association of Ghana to make their charges moderate for patrons. For this year's edition, the number of pilots have been increased from 6 last year to 10. Working with the pilots that we've been working with in the past, We've started the process of training 12 Ghanaians as the first batch. They've gone through the basics. Uh, in the weeks leading to the event, they'll go through further training. But it will not be at a point where they can become tandem pilots. But when you come there around Easter, you will see these guys able to fly on their own. The Ghana Health Service will also be on board to assist. This year's edition is expected to begin on March 30 to April 2 on the theme, You Too Can Fly. Well, we can't wait for that festival come March ending. Up next is International News. International news this afternoon. Let's turn our attentions to the United States of America, where the author of a controversial book on Donald Trump's White House says the U.S. president has less credibility than perhaps anybody who has ever walked on Earth at this point. Michael Wolf, who spent months in Mr. Trump's White House while researching the book, was responding to Mr. Trump's claims that it was full of lies. Mr. Trump's lawyers had tried to block publication of fire and fury inside the Trump White House. The book has now gone on sale. Mr. Wolf told NBC's Today Show that Mr. Trump's staff all say he is like a child. He added, what they mean by that is he has the need for instant gratification. It's all about him. This man does not read, does not listen. He's like a pinball just shooting off the sides. Well, that's all for Midday Live here on TV3. My name is Solis Rose Quarte. Tune in to our subsequent news bulletins for more news updates. Also, visit www.3news.com for some more news. Good afternoon. <laughs>